Hi, I'm Karen Webster, and welcome to the Payments.com Digital Discussion Destination 3D Secure 2.0. But first, as always, a little context. So Webster's Dictionary defines 2.0 as a term of art denoting a superior or more advanced version of an original concept, product, or service. And because it's from Webster's Dictionary, of course, we know that to be true. We also know that there have been a lot of usages of the 2.0 label over the years. Perhaps its first, and perhaps even the reason that 2.0 has become such a popular label, is Web 2.0. It was first used in 1999 by Darcy DiNucci, an authority on the end user experience on the web. She used it that year to describe the shift in web design from static to dynamic pages. More recently, there's Web 2.0, uh, so sorry, Mobile 2.0, which has been used to describe the array of interactive experiences now enjoyed by smartphone users that leverage new software and technologies, and there's now even Vegetables 2.0, which candidly is more of a branding and marketing movement than anything, but all about convincing you that the stuff you probably hated eating as a kid, things like celery root, beets, and artichoke, is now okay to order as an appetizer or side dish at a trendy restaurant and pay eight to 10 bucks for. Closer to home, though, here in payments, there's another 2.0 that's upon us, 3D Secure 2.0. 3D Secure, as all of you know, is a technology developed to improve online transaction security, and it's a technology that many countries in Europe have adopted and used to process a great majority of their online transactions. But here in the U.S., that's not the case. Analysts say that only 18% of transactions take advantage of the 3D Secure standard, in part because of the, re the reputation for a clunky user experience that it introduced into the online checkout flow. 3DS 2.0 will be different. On a variety of fronts, offering consumers a streamlined user experience and issuers and merchants greater protection against fraudulent transactions. And so here today to set us all straight on what to expect is Ankur Carrere, Director of Global Solutions Strategy at CA Technologies. Hey Ankur, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, good afternoon, Karen. Um, thanks to um, payments.com and yourself for hosting the webinar, and warm greeting to everyone else who's, uh, who's attending this session. So this is a topic that, that you and CA knows more than a little bit about since you developed the standard in the first place. But, but in prepping for the session today um, and looking ahead at what everyone is about to see, I, I was particularly excited by the range of things that we're going to get into, I think at a level that um, will be interesting and, and, and new to those who've joined us today. I mean, clearly key to 3DS 2.0 is the change to the message flow. And what you'll be touching on is the impact of those changes to mobile, the user experience, merchant interest and adoption, and the data that is now captured and used to make authentication decisions. So, Without further ado, Ankur, do you want to do you want to get us into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, what you mentioned is absolutely right, Karen. We would like to uh, definitely talk a little bit about all the changes that are coming down uh, with 3D Secure 2.0. But I think it may be good to spend just a few minutes uh, to see how 3D Secure has evolved over time since its inception, where it's heading towards, and really. You know that sets the baseline on what was the need for a um, for an overhaul of the existing protocol. When you look at the history, right, when the protocol was first developed back in 99, 2000, went live around 2001. That was all about you know, creating a trust for the cardholders to shop online. If you if you think back to that time. Online shopping was just starting. Uh, static passwords were supposed to protect us all from fraud. Uh, there was no, there was no smartphones. Uh, there was no mobile shopping. Uh, you know, Amazon, etc. Everyone was still in infancy when it was just starting, and that was one of the drivers: is, is really creating the trust, etc. And we move along the scale, and then then um, chip card migrations uh, were starting, and so a lot of fraud had started to move online. And 3D Secure actually started to become a bit more, um, bit more relevant, especially 
uh, the early adopters um, where, where chip cards were migrated, especially in Europe and, and places like that. And then, you know, move along a little bit further, mobile shopping became big. Um, there were more, the fraudsters became more sophisticated. Uh, and then there was the whole concept of big data, Hadoop, neural networks, machine learning, et cetera. All of those were just starting uh, around 2009, 2010 timeframe, which is where, where we also started thinking about, uh, you know, how can we use this big data to, to not only have an effective fraud strategy, but be able to provide a, a great customer experience. And then we continue to move on from there, right? The data sciences became more sophisticated. The need for data increased dramatically. Uh, today where we sit, um, you know, data science, uh, machine learning, et cetera, all of these different technologies are front and center in order to, um, in order to not only control fraud, but like I said, customer experience is absolutely uh, key in this as well in the adoption of 3D Secure. But the problem that happened is 17 years now, uh, you know, from when 3D Secure was first, protocol was first rolled out, the protocol itself um, has not been able to keep pace. There's been actually no change to the protocol whatsoever. And so, you know, a couple of years back, it was definitely realized that there's a need to change the protocol to keep up with the times. Uh, technologies are changing. And so, you know, it was good to understand this is a little bit of the history on how 3D Secure has progressed over the last 17 years and really, uh, where we're moving forward, and, and there is a very dire need to upgrade the protocol, which is which is now um, almost uh, here. It's a reality now. So, so Ankur, the, the 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 turning point, I guess, the trigger was the move to mobile. Is that really one of the big reasons that you thought it needed something needed to happen to change? That's right. I mean, mobile for sure, but when we look at um, the key drivers of, of 3D Secure, um, there were multiple things. One of the things was mobile absolutely was number one, uh, in my opinion, and mobile and, ex and user experience go hand in hand. Um, there's no in-app 3D Secure um, to experience on 3D Secure Flow and mobile was either non-existent or, or really not very good. Um, so, yes, mobile was driving it. Uh, we saw, you know, we've all seen statistics from the last Thanksgiving time, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, about, you know, uh, majority of the transactions now happening through some sort of mobile device or tablets, et cetera. So, yes, mobile was a turning point. And at the same time, um, the other was about merchants trusting 3D Secure, right? We all know um, that, that, you know, there's been a lack of adoption, and I think, uh, you, you have some stats there as well, but in general, the, there was a lot of feedback from the community in general about 3D Secure's uh, lack of adoption and, and it needed to change. Um, then finally, like I said, we cannot ignore the data part. Um, the data requirements from everyone all around, whether it's merchants, schemes, issuers, um, providers, and vendors such as CA, everyone's hungry for data. So all of those were drivers, but you're absolutely right in that mobile paid a huge, huge uh, uh, turning point and influence in, in uh, driving a change to the protocol. So, so Ankur, is this, a, is this an enhancement to the existing standard or is this a complete redo? We think this is a complete redo, actually. This cannot be considered just an upgrade it's a redo from the core messaging perspective, and we'll talk about that um, in, in a little bit. But from an issuer's perspective, and we, again, we'll cover this later on, but from an issuer's perspective, it may be considered more of an enablement to 2.0. So it's not as if the issuers have a huge change to make, but the underlying protocol definitely has gone, uh, undergone a complete overhaul there are some key aspects that remain unchanged, and I'll cover that about, you know, generating some of the uh, proof of transaction and uh, the authorization message, et cetera, is completely untouched as of now. So on the authentication side, yes, it's a complete overhaul from, from the message perspective, but not from implementation perspective. Got it. So, so why don't you step us through at a high level what it is? Sure, absolutely. Um, let's look at, and, and there's quite a few slides that are going to cover this, but let's look at some of the key things. Right? The number, 
one of the major items is is that the protocol itself was developed and, and is going to be owned by EMB Co. This is actually quite critical when, again, going back to the historical perspective, we see the protocol itself was, you know, mostly led by Visa and then licensed by Visa to the other schemes. So when MasterCard Secure Code was born or Amex Safety, et cetera, the different schemes when they adopted it. Um, so the, the other issue at that time was not only was it licensed by Visa, but it was also influenced fairly from the issuing or the banking community. When it was initially developed, the, um, the inputs from merchants was largely lacking, and, and so it was a little bit lopsided. The newer protocol is now developed and owned by EMB Co. I believe they started working on that a few years back, but the great part here is EMB Co. has a technical associates program, and most of the vendors see included both from banking side and uh, the merchant side are all technical associates to EMB Co. and all had equal amounts of influence on development of the protocol and are largely shaping how it should work. And so it is really, really key in the background because now the merchants or acquiring side has had an equal say and how the protocol should work, how the messages should work, and that's key, right? That's absolutely key because now the acquiring side should be able to adopt this um, in, in a much larger scale than it's been adopted until now. A couple of the other things then, you know, we talked about mobile shopping, but it's not just about shopping on the mobile phone through the browser. Uh, this time with the protocol, 3D Secure can itself be kicked off through in-app purchases, which we all know is uh, is is how is where shopping is moving towards. Whether we're using, you know, the the merchants' apps or some of the other apps to actually uh, purchase um, goods and services. There's a few other enhancements as well um, on the browser side. Uh, it's it's moving to newer technologies, and I'll cover that a little later. But then the last, which is not the least at all, is the customer experience. Right? We talk about all of the changes, etc. But the protocol itself has ensured that customer experience remains front and center. Uh, what is the cardholder going to see? How are they going to get impacted? How do we drive down abandon and failure rates, control fraud, et cetera? So all of that is part of the whole user experience and absolutely uh, front and center on, on the protocol. And it's, it's actually going to be key to ensure that it gets accepted. The merchants are not going to, uh, going to deploy anything any technology that's going to result in a negative customer experience, right? And that, and that has been <clears throat> that has been the big rub in the in the past, or at least with the current standard. There's a there's a question, Ankur, that that has come in already um, from from one of the participants. Does 3D Secure work with ACH transactions, or is this just cards? So the short answer is no. The 3D Secure protocol is only for online credit card transactions, so it's not for ACH. Now, outside of ACH, there are certain identification flows, et cetera, for onboarding on mobile wallets, et cetera. The specifications are not out, but when it comes to ACH, no. Got it. Uh, is, that on the, is that on the roadmap? Um, we have not really heard about it. I mean, our realm, of course, is really around um, the online credit card transaction uh, space. So, uh, but as far as I am aware, I don't, I don't think that's on the roadmap right now. Got it. Okay. So, um, tell us specifically what's new. You've you've alluded to data. Uh, you know, the in app the in app browser. So, why don't you step us through? that process? Sure. So what we've, uh, you know, internally when we talk about 3D Secure and when we talk to our clients, we essentially bucketize it into, you know, six different um, six, six different features, if you will, or, or highlights of 3D Secure 2.0. I'll cover about five of these um, in a little bit more detail, and for the sixth one, um, we just touched briefly upon it. Uh, basically, the six identity and verification flows is something that is, is still fairly new, and the specifications are not out from EMB code, so we're not quite sure um, how that is going to shape up. But really, I, I was talking about the key highlights, right? Data, data, data. We'll talk about what sort of data we're getting, how it's different, uh, how it can be used. 
Um, the early risk evaluation is something very key from a merchant's perspective. Um, it also is a change to the flow uh, on the protocol, and, and I'll talk about why that becomes really, really key and what's, what's the challenge that it's solving. There's frictionless, which is really about uh, customer experience. Um, you know, frictionless really means customer truly doesn't even get to know that they've, they've gone through a, some sort of authentication in the background, and then we talk about, you know, what are the different challenge mechanisms, how newer technologies for authentication are, are um, being brought into this. Um, then there's, um, you know, NAP, I briefly mentioned it. I'll talk about how that's going to work, what the UI will look like, uh, browser specification. Um, there's, there's a new, new way of displaying uh, pages for those shopping through the browser. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so we can start so, so, diving into some of these. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so let's dive into the data. While you're getting set up for that, um, what is the merchant's role in providing the, the, the data to the rich data promise of 3DS 2.0? Okay, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Karen. So there are a couple of ways in which we gather data on a 3D secure transaction. So traditionally, when you look at the 3D secure 1.0.2 protocol itself, there's only a few fields that, that really pertain to the transactional data directly. There's amount, currency, and then there's some merchant information, such as merchant ID, country, et cetera. I, I think there's about maybe six or seven fields that are useful um, in, in the current protocol. And those are all populated by the merchant when they kick off a 3D secure transaction. Now, all of the other technologies that have evolved around adaptive authentication or risk-based scoring, uh, such as you know, capturing device information or capturing location information or just tracking behavioral analytics, et cetera, they're all largely been developed by, by the individual vendors and providers such as EA, and, and we currently capture that information from the cardholder's browser. The merchants are really not involved in that. Uh, they don't get to know what's happening. Um, for merchants, actually, and, and this is a bad part about the current protocol, it's completely black box when they kick off 3D Secure. Um, now, that is a significant change that is happening on 2.0. The goal here was merchants themselves have a huge wealth of data that they're capturing as part of the, uh, part of the online transaction. They have data that is being um, being entered by the cardholder. There are certain other pieces of data. There's risk evaluations done by merchant. And so the goal was for um, merchants to be able to provide this wealth of data to the uh, to the to the issuing side and CA, for example, representing the issuing side, and be able to use that in our in our risk scoring. Now on the flip side, uh, you know. It was also decided that we should also, CA uh, and the issuing side, share whatever they can with the merchants so merchants can take some decisions on their own. And I'll just talk about that once we, once we look at the flows. But from the six or seven fields of data that merchants provide today, that's exploded. That's absolutely exploded. The number of data points that the merchants are going to be now providing as part of the initial message is going to be something like, you know, 40 or 50 different fields. Wow. So it's, it's a complete, um, like I said, it was not only a complete overhaul, it's a complete change, and it's become very, very transparent now, so that both sides, the issuing sides and the merchant sides, can trust each other with this. Wow. That's a, that's a huge change. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, so, and I, know, I, know we'll talk, I know we'll talk later about what's involved in actually Doing that, I don't want to distract from the from what the data message that you want to that you want to talk about in this particular section is. So, so maybe you could just step us through the next couple of slides about some of the cool data stuff. Yeah, and we have not listed all the data elements, but quite a few, and I'd like to highlight some of these because these are the things that we currently do not get. We have actually, and when I say we, I'm talking on behalf of the the banks and issuers. We currently don't have this level of visibility on a 3D secure transaction, and the merchants do. So you know, here I've highlighted one, for example, an address match indicator. Again, a very, very important key aspect. After all, it's the cardholder who's entered the shipping address, the billing address, and, and it's great for us to know whether those match, whether, whether they're the same, 
or whether they differ because that plays into how uh, plays into how the the predictor score may change other things a lot of um, information from from the consumer side from the cardholder side so we were talking about addresses uh, billing address, whatever uh, email, phone number, et cetera, shipping addresses, all of these that are entered by the cardholder uh, will be provided as part of the protocol. Now, I do want to put a disclaimer here. Uh, there are going to be certain regions where this sort of data may not be allowed, uh, either because of legal reasons, PII reasons, et cetera, and that is something that we are going to await from, you know, the schemes to clarify uh, you know, about such PII data, whether that will be allowed or not. But again, this, the, the more data we get, it provides us tremendous opportunity in order to do some risk scoring, uh, track these kind of um, data fields to see, you know, what is the riskiness of a transaction? Is, is it something that looks pretty safe or not? Another very important one is something uh, is, is merchant category code, and, and it is really interesting that this is something that, that was not included in the original version of the protocol. Um, it's very key for us. Uh, again, it's very key when you're doing your rule strategies uh, to, to track what sort of category code the transaction is falls under. And then we have merchant risk indicators. So this is, again, a very, very interesting one. A lot of merchants are already doing their risk scoring. They're already doing their evaluations. They, they, uh, they're tracking that. Uh, but there's no reason uh, we should know so that we can also include that as part of our decision making. And in, in response, we will also be sharing with the merchant some of our risk indicators, our um, what the issuing side decisions are, what the challenge flows are. Uh, there's going to be complete transparency in the data that goes back and forth between the merchant and the issuing side of things. So I, I know that um, you know, we, we've talked about this early on, but uh, the message flow itself is quite different, and maybe you could take us through what's different and why why the difference is so important. Sure, sure. So here is a very simplified, um, and, I, and I know it may not look simple to, to certain folks who have not seen this before, but trust me, compared to what we have today, this is far more simplified than, than what existed um, what, what existed before. Honestly, for us, we really need to concentrate on the very left column that you see, which is the initial message. And the reason this becomes very key is currently there are multiple messages that go back and forth that include the, the sparse data that I talked about earlier, but with 2.0, there'll be one single message called the AREC, which really is going to include all of these data fields uh, and available for, uh, for the issuer to make a decision on. And once the response is sent, uh, again, that response will include a lot of the data, uh, a lot of the decisioning that the issuers are taking and responding back to the merchant, uh, essentially telling the merchant, you know, either this transaction is allowed or this transaction needs to be challenged further. Now, if further challenge is required, yeah, sure, you have other flows that do some challenge and results, but the key is the very first message flow on the left uh, because most of the, the important items are going to be included in the very first message itself. The reason that becomes, again, important is today what is happening is that merchants, after seeing that there is going to be a challenge or a card is eligible for 3D Secure, sometimes decide not to proceed uh, with the challenge because they are not sure what's going to happen. You know, there have been bad implementations. There are issuers still relying on static passwords page is not rendering correctly, just a horrible customer experience, and merchants would rather take on the risk or do their own risk evaluation than, than, than exposing themselves to an abandonment happening, right? So from a message flow perspective, this completely streamlines how, how things flow, and right up front, most of the decisioning is going to be taken care of. So, so what's the impact? Um, the impact of this, right, is, uh, is Again, what we are looking at, and that brings me, it also transitions me to the very next point around the frictionless flow. What we are looking to do is, based on the first message, and this is just an indication, right, on a best practice, that essentially we're trying to see, our goal is to allow, you know, 90 or so percent of the transactions to 
go through without the need to challenge a cardholder. So all of the decisioning authentication happens behind the scenes. The cardholder absolutely never sees anything that's going on. Uh, and so that's our goal that based on all of these data analytics, all the things that we know, the technology that exists today, about 90% of the transactions should be authenticated in a silent mode, transparently, and be allowed to go through. So that's our hope, that's our goal. We think that's, that could that's probably, uh, that could be a reality. Uh, and what this lends into is, again, what is called frictionless flow, right, where you just don't bother the cardholder for any kind of additional information. But, now, but, what happens, but what happens when you do, and especially on the mobile device, which, you know, as you point out, is, is the device of choice for a lot of consumers? Right, right. So as, uh, if you do decide to challenge, and again, this 10% is, in, is just an indication. Uh, some of the good deployments may, may result in less than 5% challenge. Um, some may result more, it all depends on the underlying fraud basis point, et cetera. But what happens really when you challenge is, again, there are there is support for newer customer challenge technology. Like gone other days, absolutely gone other days for static password. And, and when I talk about the, the timelines uh, in a few more slides, we'll talk about static passwords being discontinued completely as a mandate. But uh, but even even things such as um, you know one-time passwords over SMS is really the minimum standard that is followed. But there are all these newer technologies that now are are in the market, and 3D Secure 2.0 supports uh, and even encourages adoption of these newer technologies. So when we look on the left, for example, Touch ID, right? We are all using some sort of Touch ID already. Uh, the smartphones have allowed us to do that. And there's no, and that's incorporated now as one of the, uh, one of the challenge methods, if you will, uh, around how to identify a cardholder should there be a need to challenge. There's also uh, what we are calling push notification. Again, very, very key technology. It's essentially using the bank's own app in order to push a message out to the cardholder saying, here's a transaction, you know, click yes or no to decline. So, uh, you know, some banks already, most of the banks actually who have an app are already pushing information out to cardholders. The larger banks, of course, have very sophisticated apps, and, and so the bank's app is now being uh, being rolled into um, uh, being used as an authentication mechanism as well. So, we so also have on, on, just 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 on just on that point, um, if the cardholder says yes, this is good, does it? Does it automatically then go through, or does the cardholder have to go back to the site? Because some of the experiences today, you know, you get you get the 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 the, the, the um, transaction was declined, then you have to, if it's okay, then you have to go back and re you know basically re press the buy button in order for the transaction to go through. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So. This is nothing like that, Karen. The cardholder, uh, while you're when you're shopping and when you decide to check out, right away, real time, the cardholder will get a push notification saying click yes to approve or no to decline, and they don't have to go back to the website, um, to the merchant site, go through the whole checkout process. Nothing like that. As soon as they click yes, in the background, uh, we will see we will send a message to the merchant saying this transaction was authenticated. Please proceed forward. Now, until that time, that time that, time that happens, cardholder may see a small screen on the website saying, "Please approve through your app or whatever the customized message is." But it's all completely seamless. As soon as they click yes, the message is sent back to the merchant, and they are they are done. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, what about selfie pay? Yeah. Everybody likes. So, some of these are some of the newer newer ones. Uh, selfie pay was something that. Uh, that that I think uh, Mastercard may have coined that term, if I'm not mistaken, or some we we really did some pilots with them. But essentially, there are newer technologies related to biometrics that are that are getting that are getting rolled out, right? So selfie pay was really facial recognition. Uh, there was a fancy name for that. There are other technologies around voice recognition. There are rumors. Uh, that iPhone may have, uh, you know, other facial recognition features, things like that. So the point here is when it comes to biometrics, and I'm talking about beyond Touch ID, 
When it comes to biometrics, any of those newer technologies, as long as the banks app can support it, you know, those will be um, those will be supported um, through 3D Secure 2.0 as well. And there's there's a you know really these are the new technologies that are getting um, that are getting really promoted. The last one is a simpler one. I'm not quite sure uh, whether that's truly going to pick up. Um, really, the challenge today is almost everyone still continues to rely on a one-time password over SMS, and SMS is is turning out to be fairly unreliable when you compare to some of the other other technologies. And and so you know you there's options to essentially generate one-time password on the phone in an offline manner and be able to use that uh, when being challenged for that as well. So there's a question, Ankur, that it's, it's actually a good one, which is there's a lot of emphasis on, on mobile, and while it is certainly a driver of commerce, um, a lot of commerce, about two-thirds, still originates on the desktop. So uh, this obviously applies to all channels of commerce, but it, is the experience from the consumer's perspective any different than what you've just described? Or how, how might it be different? So uh, that, that's a great question. When it comes to authentication, all of these forms of authentication that you're seeing here that are examples are all applicable to both mobile shopping as well as um, as well as shopping through the through the PC or, or or some sort of desktop, right? So these are all authentication technology that apply to both. Now things do change a little bit on how um, how browser specifications have been upgraded for 2.0, and I will come back to that in a few more slides to show you what the experience looks like uh, for a desktop based. Um, to be secure 2.0, so we'll, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Okay, okay, great. So sticking with, uh, with, with mobile, why don't you help us understand the in-app purchase experience? So, so again, this is, again, a huge, huge um, change, upgrade, whatever you want to call it, with 2.0, in that today, there is no 3D Secure allowed through in-apps. Now, certain apps have been forced to do 3D Secure um, for countries that mandate that. For example, in India, 3D Secure, or actually two-factor authentication is mandated for online shopping. So in that case, Uber and Amazon and others have, you know, have found a way to navigate the cardholder away from the app authenticate them and then bring them back, but the experience is very cluttered. Uh, it's not it's not streamlined. 2.0 embraces that. 2.0 is saying, yes, absolutely, that's the way things are moving. And so it has um, incorporated different aspects in, in, in different, you know, um, data points, et cetera, that are all needed in order to kick off a 3D secure, uh, 3D secure transaction through the app. Now, there are different uh, there are different flows and different technologies incorporated, and I'll just briefly touch upon these. So native UI, and this is, again, very powerful in that it provides merchants complete control on how they want to proceed forward with 3D Secure. What native UI means is the card the, the cardholder, even when they're shopping, even if they get to challenge, the challenge will look like the the in-app, uh, that the app itself is challenging them. So the look and feel, the UI, uh, will all be rendered from what the merchant's app looks like. So the card order doesn't feel like they're getting navigated away, some kind of phishing thing is happening or, or something's not right. And it allows merchants to be in complete control of what data they want to display, how they want to display it, uh, what sort of fields, and, and, and be able to proceed forward with the transaction. HTML, like I said, I'll come back to that. But again, uh, for HTML or browser-based apps or, or desktop shopping, uh, that still remains in the control of the issuer. Issuers can still, still control what the UI looks like, what the cardholder experience is, is and, and then move forward with that. And the last one is uh, out-of-band, really out-of-band sort of ties in with some of the things I was talking about previously. Uh, when we talk about push notifications or selfie pay and things like that, those are all out of band authentication where the cardholder has to navigate away from their app, be able to authenticate and come back. 
but the 2.0, um, uh, the transaction flows itself account for that and ensure that the transactions don't get abandoned or lost or the card holder gets too distracted out of that. Now, Ankur, you, you, met, you mentioned the consumer, I was just going to ask you a question, good, good, good segue. You know, how, how do you make sure that the consumer experience is the same re regardless? Because that, that, that's also the confusing part from the consumer standpoint. Right, right. So again, uh, I think it comes down to, to what I was talking about previously, right, about native UI versus HTML is when it comes to native UI, the merchants are going to be in complete control of what the, the user experience, at least from a UI perspective, looks like for the cardholder. So whether it's you or I or anyone else shopping on the same merchant app, when I go through a challenge flow, it is all standardized. But it also comes down to how information will be displayed. And, and you can see here on the slide, we talk about standardization being key. All of the UI elements, when it comes to how apps will be displaying any sort of information to the cardholder from, from 3D Secure perspective, is all being standardized. standardized. All of the labels, uh, you know, what should be displayed, how it should be displayed, the cardholder flows, um, you know, the, the, like I said, even, even things such as, you know, information or SAQs or need help, et cetera, every aspect of how cardholder views uh, be, uh, views the screens as part of the flow, everything is standardized so that there is a complete consistency of user experience, regardless of whether you're using an app in the U.S. or U.K. or, or wherever else you may be. So, so one question before we get to the browser piece, which I know um, is important for the last question. Um, this is a good one. Uh, so how, how is it possible to know whether the cardholder who registered the card is in fact the actual cardholder and not and not a bad guy that's gotten a hold of a credential. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and that actually ties up with um, with the data analytics that we run, right? So I'm going to segue a little bit into into how that works. There are various different things that we look at when you try to do a risk scoring on a transaction, right? From our, I'm just talking from a CA perspective now. Not only are we tracking, um, you know, the transactional behavior for a particular cardholder, we are also tracking a lot of key data elements when it comes to devices and location. So for device, we look, we go beyond just looking at or setting a cookie on a, on a device. We are looking at the device characteristics. We're looking at browsers, fonts, plugins in language, all these different, there are about eight or ten different characteristics that we capture from a device. We're also looking at location and how location's changing, you know, are, is the cardholder moving? Are we seeing a transaction from Boston and then ten minutes later are we seeing it from Europe or Asia? We are also tracking a lot of behavioral patterns on how cardholders are shopping. You know, is this the typical website that they go to? Is this a typical uh, time and day of shopping? So there is many, many, many different data points that we are capturing uh, and then doing some, some pretty sophisticated analytics using machine learning, using neural net models, et cetera. So from all of these perspectives, even though a cardholder is legitimate, let's say it's an account takeover, they've, 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 they've stolen the credentials and they're logging in as a legitimate cardholder, but based on all of these other factors, you can still determine whether this, car, this, this transaction is going to be risky or not. Right, so it goes beyond just us knowing whether the cardholder is legit or not, because we don't look at, you know, just email and password and stuff like that. We are looking at a broad, very deep historical patterns. We also not only track patterns for cardholders, we also track patterns for those particular portfolios of the banks uh, and and regional patterns. Right, so uh, Bank ABC. Uh, let's say they have a debit portfolio, right? And within that bin, we are tracking, you know, what sort of what sort of portfolio is this? Uh, credit cards have different patterns. Prepaid cards have different patterns, different amounts. There's a lot of sophistication that goes on in the back end in order to determine um, the riskiness of a transaction. So I think just because someone has credentials, uh, obviously it's risky. They can do a lot, but that also um, that that doesn't mean that that's all that we look at. 
Got it. So let's move on to the browser question because I know we want to get to, you know, what's what's next and that and now what. That's right. So um, again, on the browser specifications, what you see on the left is essentially how we are displaying uh, how the cardholder sees the screen today. Right? It's usually it's open as an inline window within a merchant's website, which is what you're seeing on the left. Now, uh, again, we have all kinds of different implementations. There could be scroll bars. I mean, some some screens don't render correctly, especially when it comes to uh, comes to mobile or tablets. You know, the the, the, if, if the sites are not coded correctly with responsive web design, there are lots of issues. I won't get into every one of them here. But there is new specifications. There's a technology called Lightbox being promoted. It's an iframe technology. And what you see on the right is essentially what a change may look like. And this is, this is a shopping that's being done on the desktop, right? So again, same information, but it's just going to be displayed in a slightly different, uh, different format where the merchant still is in the background. You can see it, it's a bit blurred, but the verification or authentication is actually front and center so that the cardholders can move through that. Coming back to the question that was asked earlier, all of those technologies that you see for authentication, the touch ID, et cetera, those are all applicable here as well. So if I'm, you know, here you're seeing an example where the, 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 the screenshot talks about one-time password over SMS, but uh, if let's say it was a push notification, let's take an example. A cardholder may just see a screen which says, please um, click yes or no on your app, et cetera. And as soon as they, de as they do that, we send a message back, the screen disappears, and they're back on the merchant site automatically, the transactions move forward. So, you know, the, the desktop, I understand it's still, you know, accounting for majority of the transactions. And, and every one of those technologies is, is useful both on the desk as well as um, on True Mobile. Ankur, is there, is there concern that this does present friction from the merchant standpoint because it does interrupt the flow? It, it does require that, uh, you know, an email be checked or an SMS be checked for a, for a one-time one code? Yeah, yeah. So, that's the concern we're trying to uh, resolve. So, and I, I know we spend a lot of time talking about different authentication and challenge mechanisms in this. I need you to, uh, need everyone to just concentrate on the slide a few times back that this challenge, this interruption should happen less than 10% of the time uh, for a transaction. So, if I'm processing a million, uh, let's say I'm processing a million transactions a day, this should happen you know, less than 10,000 times, and less than 10%. So we spend a lot of time and energy talking about challenges. We cannot right. ignore the fact that this is going to be rare occurrence for a cardholder. Most of the yeah. time, the cardholder should never see anything at all um, when they're proceeding to a transaction. Got it. Um, there's In a follow-up uh, question. Just, just, just sorry, one, one just... point from that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Ankur. I was just going to say one point on that, that you know, quite a few of the implementations actually eliminate or don't have any sort of challenge whatsoever, uh, especially when it comes to 3D secure for commercial cards, corporate cards, or prepaid cards, where there is no good cardholder data to challenge. Uh, most of those implementations actually only rely purely on, on risk analytics to either allow the transaction or they fail the transaction. Uh, you know, banks and issuers are actually starting to think about not challenging the cardholder at all. Yep. Yeah, interesting. Um, the follow-up question to the question about um, asserting that it's truly the right cardholder and not someone impersonating the cardholder with stolen credentials. Um, what about friendly fraud, which is sort of the essence of the question? So client says there's, you know, stuff happening that is not authorized, yet there's no other flags that suggest that there's, um, that there is some sort of fraud happening. Um, is there any certainty associated with using this protocol to suss out the friendly fraudsters that are trying to get away with, with something? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because friendly fraud in general, is a very very tough one um, to 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 um, to identify, right? Because 
let's assume my son steals my, not steals, just gets hold of my credit card and wants to go buy something. Now he's using, he's coming in from the same IP that I've shopped from home. He may or may not be using similar devices that, uh, that we've seen before. Uh, so in terms of friendly fraud, yes, that is actually fairly tough to, uh, tough to identify. One of the things that does help there is again on the, uh, when I look at behavioral analytics side, then yes, that's the, that's the one method that you can actually try to, uh, try to identify it. I mean, my son's not going to go buy the same things that I buy typically. Uh, so from that perspective, yes, the behavioral side of things should raise a flag that something is out of the ordinary, but the question is really valid in that, you know, friendly fraud is one that is very, typically very, very tough uh, to identify simply because my device, my, you know, my, my card, you know, everything's uh, very similar in location. Yep, yep. Um, so no, no, good, no, no good answers really because uh, um, I guess it then becomes an issue or decision on what to do. It's an issuer decision, um, and it also depends on how issuers uh, implement their their fraud strategy. Some issuers control it very tightly, and and they prefer to challenge more than less. Uh, other issuers may decide to challenge, you know, hardly anybody. And and so the less you challenge, uh, you know, all of these technologies that we we look at, there is always going to be some false positive, right? There is no one technology that is going to catch 100% of the fraud or has 0% false positive yeah. issue, right? So there's definitely something that's going to get, um, get get missed. Friendly fraud, like I said, is tougher, although behavioral analytics should still do a very good job in identifying, uh, you know, what sort of goods are being purchased and from what merchant and from at what time. Right. Okay. So. So in the time remaining, important uh, concept to, to, to get through is what should issuers be thinking about and actually doing to prepare? Yeah, so quite a few things. Um, and, and all of these things that I mentioned here is available today, right? There's no reason for issuers to be waiting on any of these things. Number one, we took, well, actually, let me just talk about risk-based authentication first because that is number one in, in my opinion. Because we are seeing less and less transactions being challenged, uh, less and less friction, everyone's promoting frictionless, that's what merchants want. The only way to do that is to have a sophisticated risk-based strategy running underneath the, um, the in implementation. Right, whether, and I've talked about this multiple times, whether you're using, you know, um, models, artificial intelligence, machine learning, they're all kinds of different technologies that are out there, but those have to be implemented and issuers absolutely uh, need to move uh, to some sort of risk-based authentication in order to get ready for 2.0. And again, they don't have to wait for 2.0 to come, come around. This is something they should be, they should be doing. From our own experience, um, we really haven't implemented any issuer without risk-based, I think, in the last two to three years. So, so I think it, most of the, almost every new issuer that's gone through 3D Secure is already there. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of um, legacy issuers out there, uh, older portfolios that need to move to this absolutely right away. Then there are other things, right? Authentication strategy we talked about. You know, there are very few, but still some issuers remaining on some sort of static password, um, they, or they may be asking some sort of KBA or static questions. All of those are really older technologies. Um, no one's promoting that anymore. And like I said, the bare minimum standard is a one-time password over SMS, but there are newer technologies. But really, issuers need to look at how they're going to authenticate, what sort of um, authentication technology they want to deploy, in order to, to identify when, whenever you want to challenge a cardholder. And that also plays into the data integrity, right? Um, um, we're getting a lot more data. We're getting all, we talked about all the data now. And great opportunity with all of the data is also that the fact that we can um, use that to, to match that against what the issuers have on their side. So just taking one example, if we do get the billing address and the shipping address, at least the billing address can be matched against what the card hold, uh, has uh, set up on the issuing site, or email address, or phone number. So you know, we see a lot of 
uh, we hear a lot of issuers complain that they don't have good data or they haven't segregated mobile number versus home number, things like that. I think it's really important to, to look into the sort of data that has been captured and how that can be used in order to match against the data that we're getting on the, in the transaction. Uh, Ankur, do you anticipate a mandate? Um, for 2.0? Well, absolutely. I think uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, and, and this this uh, title is not 100% correct. Uh, it should talk about the timeline, but eventually, I think there's going to be a mandate um, for issuers to move from 1.0 to 2.0. I don't anticipate a mandate being that there has to be 3D secure in a in a certain region. Some governments have done that. Uh, India, Singapore, Malaysia, you know, these governments have mandated some sort of authentication for every uh, online transaction, which is not the best way to move forward. But when we look at, um, when we look at what sort of timelines, uh, let's, let's talk about a little bit of this, right? So one of the key things is, is something from MasterCard that got rolled out sometime back called identity check. And eventually the goal is for identity check to completely replace uh, the current 3D secure protocol, which is termed MasterCard Secure Code, uh, their deadline is December 2019. Um, now we've been, you know, we have pretty much moved or um, in the process of moving all of the MasterCard deployments here onto the Identity Check program. Uh, but I think it's great because Identity Check not only, it's not for 2.0, by the way, it's just setting up baselines on how authentication should happen in the online world. Uh, and they've, they've completely mandated removal of static elements, static passwords. They are uh, just short of mandating, but strongly recommending risk-based authentication, et cetera. So we feel that, that identity check is going to be great in terms of promoting, uh, you know, newer ways of, of authenticating cardholders. Similarly, Visa, and I'm moving forward actually, Visa has a deadline of April 2018 where they have uh, at least for North America, Latin America, and then, uh, you know, later on in the year in 2018 for the rest of the world, where they said there's no static elements that will be allowed for authentication, no static password, et cetera. When it comes to, so to answer your question, Karen, whether 3D Secure will be mandated, I think is, is tough to say. Uh, I think that's a pretty big step, and unless the uh, the merchants are okay with it, I doubt that it'll be mandated by 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 you know globally for sure. But yes, there will absolutely be a mandate for existing 1.0 implementations to completely convert to 2.0, and uh, that's probably you know going to happen by end of 2019 or or sometime in 2020. I do want to point out a couple of the key timelines really quickly. Um, we are still awaiting certifications of ACSs to happen um, from EMECO, and uh, it's got pushed out a couple of times. Uh, we think that by October, uh, we should be certified with, with, with 2.0 and be able to roll that out. Um, and our product should be live uh, sometime towards the end of this year. That is not to say that we'll see any transactions then. I think the reality is, some of the initial pilot transactions will start happening sometime towards the quarter one of 2018. We are in talks and um, partnerships with some of the really large teams and, and banks um, and hoping to identify certain merchants that will start participating in that pilot in the early part of 2018. Uh, but truly, I think by, by mid of 2018, 2.0 should be in full effect, I, I believe large-scale um, enablement should be happening for 2.0 by that time, uh, and we should see a lot more transactions going through. The key here, again, is we anticipate a massive surge in volume simply because of the mobile aspect of shopping being allowed with 2.0 uh, with, um, you know, with in-app purchases and things like that. Uh, uh, last, the last key date that I know from Visa is April 2019, they have set a date of, uh, I think it's April 12th, uh, that the liability shift for 2.0 for attempted transactions will go into effect. So uh, definitely Visa has come up with that date and we fully expect MasterCard to have some sort of um, stronger guidelines around timelines as well anytime. So that's not a, man so it's not a mandate in the sense that it's required, but the liability shift is, 
you know, it's a it's a big deal, particularly particularly online. So yeah, it's a carrot. Um, <laughs> it's a yeah, carrot. It's a carrot. It's a carrot. Um, and you know, speaking of the liability shift, what what do merchants need to be doing? Because clearly, they're a big part of the they're a big part of the puzzle here. But but the April 2019 liability shift is probably something to uh, that, they, that they have their eyes on, too. Sure. Now, merchants, uh, of course, also need to make certain changes, sim similar to how the issuing side um, changes are being done. One of the key, absolutely key components is, um, is an SDK that is being rolled out by EMECO as part of 2.0. The SDK will allow uh, the merchants to essentially kick off 3D secure through um, through in-app purchases. But there's a whole um, there's a whole environment from merchant side called the 3D secure requester environment. And again, it's very similar to the MPI deployment that happens today for 3DS 1.0, except in this case, yes, they will be required to at least make certain changes uh, on their side in order to kick off 3D secure. But the changes, again, themselves should be fairly straightforward, uh, just like it is today. Uh, as far as SDK goes, they need to incorporate that within the, within, the, within the merchant app, and it's going to be a pretty much simple snippet of code. Uh, same thing goes with other components on the merchant side. It should be very, very straightforward, and I anticipate you know, a lot of the companies, similar to CA on the issuing side, there are companies on the acquiring side which should be able to manage that for the merchants um, in a very seamless manner. So a, a question, we have just a few minutes left. Um, you know, mobile is, is, is an emerging uh, category of connected device that consumers are using to transact, but there are an awful lot of other technology environments too. The question here is wearables. Clearly not driving a lot of commerce yet, but that's certainly the expectation. Any uh, any long-term roadmap uh, with respect to wearables and other connected devices? Yeah, that's, uh, again, very good. One of the things that I did not uh, cover here simply because we don't have enough, uh, enough information yet is the last part, which was identification and verification flows. So EMB Co. Mm -hmm. is, in fact, um, the, the specifications do talk about being able to um, to identify and authenticate, you know, devices on IoT, for example, right, the Internet of Things that we talked about. So that includes wearables and other connected devices, which are not directly, uh, which are not humans, right, right away. Uh, the specifications for IDNB and IoT, et cetera, is still awaited, and but there is definitely, um, uh, EMECO is definitely working on on getting those sort of specifications out. So there will be something around there, we just don't know yet what it is. And a, a final question in the minute that we have. Um, there's a question specifically around dual authentication. So the example cited is P2P uh, money transfer app. Uh, if a non-verified device requests a transfer, it will ping the authorized device requesting for permission to proceed. Is that going to be a similar use case with uh, 3D2 uh, Secure 2.0, or is there something different that will happen? Um, it looks similar, but uh, for a 3D Secure transaction to happen, there are three parties that need to be involved and enabled for 3D Secure. There's the merchant side, right? There's issuing side, but then there's also also, the schemes um, that allow for these messages to go back and forth, so taking MasterCard, Visa, Discover, Annex as examples. Now, when in a P2P uh, transaction, if there is no central scheme uh, that is available in order to ensure that the transactions are connected between, between merchants and issuers, then they cannot have 3D secure protocol implemented there. Now, there is, again, uh, there is the availability that this protocol should be able to use, be used outside of the schemes themselves. It may, may not be called 3D secure, but the protocol does have provision so that similar authentication methods can be applied to, to, to transactions that are non-credit card transactions or non, so whether it's P2P, et cetera. But again, the specifications are not quite out yet on how that will be implemented or, or whether that's going to be 
you know, when that's going to be available, but we know that EMA Core is going to work on something like that. Excellent. Well, the questions that we didn't have time to get to, Ankur, I'll pass on to you and as, the, as part of the write-up. Um, if you would be so kind as to respond to those, that would be awesome. It was a, a great discussion, and I, I think everyone who joined learned a lot. I know I did, and I really appreciate your sharing your insights with all of us today. Thank you. Absolutely, and again, Karen, thank you, Payments.com, uh, for hosting this, and to obviously thanks to everyone else who who attended this and this and then. Yes, thank you. Thanks to all who gave your time today, and have a great rest of the day and a good week. Thank you. Bye.